Well, thank you so much, John, for being a wonderful host. Um, I'm going to leave this up for just a couple of seconds so that uh, all of you can get over to the Mentimeter. Uh, I'm also going to reshare the direct link to it in the meeting chat. Um, the best way to do this, I, I found, is to have uh, to have it on your phone so that you can kind of see the Zoom and the chat and all that on one screen and then do the Mentimeter responses on your phone. But whatever way you'd like to, that's totally fine with us. Just making sure uh, that y'all see this because we are uh, seeing a lot of participants coming in right now. My goodness, that's a lot. Okay, I'm going to repost this in chat. I know if you've been here since uh, 1144, you've seen this link about four times, but we have quite a few people. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I am posting the direct Mentimeter link into the chat. Cool. All right. So I think we are ready to move. Um, but be sure to uh, copy this. And if somebody comes in and says, hey, how do I get to it? You can always respond that way. I'm going to be operating uh, this full screen from here. So I will not be able to immediately jump to the chat. OK, so let's get started. Come on now. Oh, OK, a little bit of lag. There we go. <laughs> Okay, well, hi everyone and welcome to our presentation, OER Discovery, Ensuring OER Rise to the Top. Uh, my name is Rebecca Honeycutt and I'm the Collections Management Librarian. Uh, next slide, please, Jeff. Um, I'd like to introduce you to my colleagues, starting with Beth Burnett, Institutional Repository Librarian, Nikki cannon Retch, an ALG Champion and Research Services Librarian, and Jeff Mortimer, Discovery Services Librarian. All of us are from Georgia Southern University. We have finally Jeff Gallant, who is the lone non-Georgia Southern member here, and he is the program director for Affordable Learning Georgia. Next slide, please. So in this presentation, we will cover the current status of things related to OER materials. We'll start off with Jeff Gallant as we take a look at Affordable Learning Georgia and its current work. We'll then move to the issues and challenges with Nikki, who will review the challenges faced with helping faculty. And then we'll move to current trends with myself and Jeff Mortimer. Here we'll discuss what's currently happening with cataloging and description of these resources. Then finally, we'll move to Beth and what Georgia Southern is currently doing with OER materials and our digital commons prototype. In addition to these topics, we will be presenting three conversation starters using Mentimeter, posing questions to you about how your institutions are handling OER materials, and now I will turn it over to Jeff Gallant, who will possibly continue uh, covering Mentimeter and uh, any with our questions and your responses and his current his topic, excuse me, of current status of things. Jeff. OK, so uh, if you just got here, welcome. Uh, we have quite a few participants and it's really cool to see you all. I am going to share the direct link to Mentimeter in the chat again, because Zoom is not good about showing you past chats from before you came in. Um, I am going to get started, though, because my uh, my part of this is not the feature. This is more about how it is and how it used to be over at Affordable Learning Georgia, so that Georgia Southern's team can show you what they're doing, which is super cool. So we started out all the way back in uh, 2013 as a little pilot team. And one of the things that we wanted to do was encourage uh, faculty to take action within at least a team of two. And so that's where our uh, transformation grants and uh, eventually our continuous improvement grants came from. Uh, we assumed because we just got around to uh, doing this uh, at the time that Merlot was really big and OpenStax just released all of their texts, uh, that faculty were going to find these materials and do a, a straight adoption of them. Uh, we weren't asking them to create an entire open textbook or ancillary materials. We were just saying, uh, you're, you're replacing the expensive materials in the classroom with uh, OER and other affordable materials. Um, what we found was that plenty of materials were created. 
uh, whether they were lecture slides or an entire website for an open course, uh, all the way to some teams authoring their own textbook. And we didn't have a place for them. So um, we had some scholarly repositories here and there. And uh, you know, some institutions were hosting those materials uh, for the institutional participants, but we didn't have a system-wide one. So we were uh, looking into that, but linking folks to the free stuff that was out there. Mervo Content Builder was there. Uh, OER Commons, of course, uh, has Open Author, and they did back then too. Um, there were campus websites, although we kept warning people that uh, any kind of campus website migration uh, would be a problem. Any personal websites hosted on a campus website thing might disappear if you leave. Uh, Soft Chalk was great. You could share it through the cloud if you subscribe to it. LibGuides uh, and a couple of other educational sharing space, say, spaces that weren't necessarily OER, but they were at least free, like Kariki. So we started a subscription service to B Press Digital Commons uh, at um, around 2016 is when it actually got built and started. Um, plenty of metadata there because it's all set up to be a scholarly communications type of repository, uh, really geared towards journals. So there's already uh, open archive, uh, yeah, the Open Archives Initiatives uh, protocol for metadata harvesting baked in there along with some Google Analytics. Uh, there are some custom fields that you can change, which is good because we needed them. Uh, Creative Commons licenses, select them right from a drop down menu. Uh, we couldn't really group materials by course numbers, by subjects. We had some makeshift ways of doing that, uh, combining them into various series or communities. Um, ancillaries, it was hard to link those together once something was created for a text that already exists. And of course, they were all uh, static files. You just download a PDF, download a Word document, et cetera. Or we could link over to someone's website, but that's not enabling anything new at that point. So there's no interactivity going on. Uh, in 2020, that changed. Um, I had been complaining about the lack of a platform to do this, and uh, both Manifold and Pressbooks really stepped up around 2019 and 2020. We were part of the second pilot cohort for Manifold. Um, we helped them out when they were just getting started and basically just providing a lot of feedback. Um, it's great that they have annotations. You can do uh, highlighting within a group, for example, an entire class with an instructor. Uh, there's a lot of accessibility features. Um, just like they mentioned yesterday, being able to change the font, being able to change uh, light mode to dark mode, having structured text, that is super helpful. Um, it's very easy to group your ancillary materials with the textbook in a nice organized way. Um, the problem, of course, is that this is not set up to be a scholarly repository. So from the start, they didn't have things like uh, a protocol for metadata harvesting baked in the way that Digital Commons does. It's still not there. Um, so we do a lot of metadata through tags. What's cool about it is that we can then take a smart collection of one of those tags and feature it on the page, name it something, and now you've got your open textbooks, you've got your ancillary materials, you've got your adoptions, and it just kind of shows up that way. Uh, we can also, if anyone's like, what are all the ones for calculus? We could take the calculus tag and put it in a collection. That's really nice. Um, so it's the primary platform for putting new materials out there. Uh, we are still linking from uh, the Digital Commons one, though. Uh, so we had to change some metadata in order to make this OER uh, friendly. Um, just uh, all the way back to our digital commons repository. The course names and course numbers are super important, and they're not native to these types of platforms. Um, the type of material. So often, if you are publishing journals, of course, you're publishing articles. Sometimes it's proceedings, but we had things like uh, lecture slides. We had homework, stuff like that. Um, a way to get to the print version of a text, that option needs to be there. Uh, we have the, uni the University of North Georgia Press, and we need to be able to link over to them too. And then things like editors and contributing authors, they, you can kind of do it in uh, Digital Commons, but you can actually do it in Manifold, which is nice. Uh, so I am going to pass this on because we are going to move into the future as we start looking at the current issue and the challenges to address.
Thank you, Jeff. You can go on to the next slide. So I am an instructional librarian, and I will say that this is from the point of view of an instructional librarian who also, like many others out there, has OER thrown into my duties, but it's not my main job. It's just mixed in with all my other duties as an instructional librarian. But as the person on the campus, I am the one who does help faculty and whomever locate and learn how to use OER materials. So especially since our friend COVID hit the scene, there's been a stream growing interest in OER. Not to mention people are finally coming to realize 100% that the cost of course materials is a true barrier to many of our students. So the interest is growing, the availability is growing, but there is still some barriers out there, especially for my faculty. OER tends to be poorly defined and in many situations like Affordable Learning Georgia, it is fantastic, but Affordable Learning Georgia also embraces the use of proprietary materials from the library through library subscriptions. And that often confuses faculty. So they don't really have a firm sense of what is truly OER, what is freely available, and what is simply being made free to our students because we have already paid a very large price for it. Um, it's often poorly integrated into some areas as well. So there's a lot of decisions on how do we spend our effort to make OER discoverable regionally and globally. And we have actually been tasked by our Dean of the Libraries to make the OER on our campus easier to discover for our faculty so that they realize it is an option for use in their classes. Next slide, please. So again, the um, challenges that go out there, there are multiple platforms, as Jeff Gallant mentioned, for OER. It's difficult to keep up, and many of these platforms have limited searches simply because because they only contain a small portion of the OER that is actually out there. So OpenStax, for instance, fantastic. We all know its credibility, but they don't have materials for every course out there. Um, so there's multiple searches for faculty to learn, different interfaces, limited searches in some instances. Multiple institutions also host their own OER to highlight the materials their faculty are creating. So again, limited subjects because as they should be, they are focusing on the curricular of their particular institution. There may be some access issues, especially like the faculty at Georgia Southern. They are encouraged to also pull library subscription materials into much of this. So if you're not a member of their institution, you won't have access to that. And also just defining again what OER actually is, the difference between that and just other materials. So as an OER librarian or instructional librarian, we try to help as much as possible. Um, we often will curate lists specifically for faculty, but in many cases it's kind of a stab in the dark because I'm just going based on what their syllabus says, their student learning objectives are, and I have to make guesses. And then of course, it's up to the faculty to fully evaluate these materials and decide if they're actually going to be useful for their course. Um, many of us out there create LibGuides because we all are a fan of LibGuides in library world. Um, and this LibGuide makes perfect sense to me. It has become a monstrous LibGuide and I use it almost daily to search and find mater sort materials. It does not always make sense to my faculty. So there's that problem. As much as I try to make it user friendly, it's really more user friendly to me than it is to some of the faculty who would actually need it. Next slide, please. So Part of the challenge, as I said, I'm an instructional librarian, is that the team has been slow to build, kind of, especially at our institution in particular. Um, and in Georgia, we've noticed at our Affordable Learning Georgia meetings, and Jeff Gallant has confirmed this, the majority of us who are doing OER 
are public facing or instructional librarians. Occasionally some SCALCOM librarians, but still very much public facing. We have been better at pulling our instructional designers into the fold and ALG now has an instructional designer champion along with the librarian champions. So these partnerships have been fantastic, but they're usually also very public facing individuals. The group we have been leaving out more so than we should be are our technical services group. Those persons who actually are catalogers and institutional repository librarians and discovery services librarians. So I'm out here doing all of this OER work, but it's only been recently that I've been touching base with my tech services group saying, okay, so what do we do with this stuff? How do we make it discoverable? How do we define it in our systems? Next slide. So here's our first conversation starter. Um, remember that you can enter into Mentimeter or into the chat if you want to. How does your institution help faculty navigate what is available in the OER world? We'll give everyone a few moments to respond. We can see some responses coming in. So a lot of what I've already mentioned, one-on-one -on -one consultations, libguides are showing up, curated list. Oh, somebody has a full-time OER librarian. That's awesome. We have a searchable catalog that mirrors BC campus. Lots of libguides and individual consultations. Well, we have an e-learning committee and librarians that help with links and information. That sounds wonderful. A giant Google sheet. Holy moly. <laughs> right. Lots of with direct librarian help. LibGuide showing up multiple times. Affordable Learning Exchange. Hello, Ohio State. Yes. Oh, someone is working some webinars in there. Nice. Hit or miss right now. Yes. Workshops. We do a lot of that as well. Somebody wants that Google Sheet to be shared. Oh, starting to add OER into the subject guides. That's a nice touch. Just going to quickly show a link that someone had a list of OER adopted by college here. That's really cool. Oh, nice. And now I am going to wrestle with Mentimeter until it goes back to full screen. There we go. Okay, I'm gonna move forward, but this is amazing. Thank you. Uh, Robin says, will we get a copy of the chat? Um, you can definitely make a copy of the chat um, with the save chat. If you click on the dot, dot, dot from uh, the uh, the chat part. Oh, yep, she sees that. Okay, good. Cool. I will move on. Okay, so current trends. Uh, go ahead to the next slide, please, Jeff. So what are the current trends in cataloging OER materials? Well, we call this the Wild West of cataloging and discovery because there aren't really any trends in this area. There's no real consensus about metadata standards or cataloging practice. 
However, there are a few things that we can see developing amongst librarians on this topic. One is agreement in OER materials needing quality description and cataloging. Even with this consensus though, there is as of yet no established standards or practices. The second thing we're seeing is that most examples of OER cataloging are focused on local discovery only at individual institutions. Recently, I sent out a question on a national listserv to catalogers about what they were seeing or doing regarding these materials. And I got a handful of responses, which I was pretty excited about. <laughs> um, a few people mentioned mark fields that should be used when cataloging OERs. Um, several 3XX fields and 5XX fields were specifically mentioned. Um, a few other respondents said that their OER materials were being housed in their institutional repositories. So these responses and the use of repositories shows in a very small pool that there is some validity to our statement that the focus is on local discovery. And it also validates our third point here that repositories are either creating their own metadata standards for local discovery, or they are adopting metadata standards from a third party repository. So finally, there is also evidence of large groups taking on the creation of standards and practices, which we can see through the Spark OER Discovery Work Group. This is a group of nine institutions coming together to work on this question, and it's a step toward the development of trends in this area. However, Spark uh, leads us to our next slide on trends, and I'll let Jeff take it from here. Jeff? Oh, Jeff, you're on mute. <laughs> I apologize. Inevitably, I would be the one to, to stay on mute. I apologize. So um, as Rebecca has described, um, you know, there is some work in, in this area, but it, it really remains scattered. So even with the publication of the OER metadata Rosetta Stone, we really remain where we so often find ourselves, awash in a sea of competing standards. Um, if you haven't seen this cartoon before, which I think most folks in library technical services has, have, it, it sums up our present moment pretty well. Short of the OER community coalescing around an OER repository or a preferred metadata schema, we're unlikely to see much progress toward a shared standard for OER description and sharing. What we shouldn't do, however, is put off the effort of describing our institutions that we are and making it at least nominally discoverable. Um, but if so, then how should we proceed? Next slide, please. Today, the most useful advice we found on this is also the most pragmatic. In a 2020 paper, a recommendation for core metadata elements for use in OER repositories um, uh, by Bobby Bothman uh, conducted an extensive meta analysis of current OER metadata schemas and came up with the following advice. Don't wait for perfect, but instead adopt the most complete and patron friendly schema you can find with the best chance of crosswalking your records later on when the community does coalesce around a repository or a schema. Based on his analysis, Bobby also has a recommendation for what schema to employ now. He says only the OER common schema, which is closely based on the IEEE LOM or learning object metadata standard, ticks off most of the boxes. Um, as such, the IEEE LOM should be promoted as the scheme of choice for future OER metadata endeavors. So um, what did we have to lose? We took Bobby's advice which you'll hear more about as Beth walks through our OER collection prototype in Digital Commons. But first, we have another question for you. Next slide. So back to Minimeter. And our question to you is this. What challenges have you experienced or do you anticipate experiencing with making your institution so we are more discoverable?
So definitely too many repository options, but none of them fit the exact need, right? And that gets back to the challenge of standards as well. Wow, lots of responses. This is great. Making the Pressbooks versions the top result in whatever search engine or discovery tool you're supporting, also a real challenge. Yeah, I think that that also has to do with version control too. Right. Uh, any anything that you want to be the top results because it's the most updated version. Limitations of institutional repository platform, right? You know, we lack standards. We lack um, focus on you know a small group of repositories um, to to work with and. We have no, you know, sort of dedicated platform that is that has um, come into existence yet. Getting the taxonomies that make sense to us per content and curriculum to line up sufficiently with others. That's absolutely right. The way that faculty at one institution might think about the organization and discovery of, of OER may differ, differ at other institutions. Ideally, we'd have platforms that would achieve a common standard, but also allow customization of how those resources are represented in other contexts. Some, uh, some feedback that the conversation is super exciting. I like all the challenges, question mark. <laughs> yeah. Yep, it, it really is the Wild West. We don't know whether something exists or where to find it. Nobody knows where to go these days. In varying formats, different uh, mean different platforms, which begs the question, are you know, do we need to stop thinking in terms of one platform to rule them all? Maybe we need multiple plat plat platforms for different kind of content, but then we need a metadata platform to make it discoverable. I'm finding that just because it's easy doesn't mean it's best. Often, I think we uh, encountered that when with the rise of Google back in the day, too. And putting it in multiple repositories, overwhelming tasks, struggled with um, version control. I, I really know here, putting it in multiple repositories. Ideally, we're not putting our OER into multiple repositories. We're making our OER discoverable in, in multiple indices, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the question is how to make the, the metadata sufficiently portable to be discoverable without replication of content. And if you've got remixes or revisions, right. how can we link all those together? Yeah. OER metadata tends to be available in simple Dublin core. Yep. Mm -hmm. Great SEO, but it's not made for OER. Very, very common. Some resources are flexible, defy the expectation of being a static resource. Yeah, and then what do you do with the metadata at that point? That's interesting. Yeah. Profit driven thinking by educational institutions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, time needs to be funded. That is for sure. Any phrase that has the word rule in it. Yeah, probably no. <laughs> <laughs> the open community, uh, ladies and gentlemen, every open uh, community too. <laughs> Okay, uh, moving forward. So we are going to the prototype at this point. Okay, thank you. So I'll be addressing Georgia Southern University's recent OER efforts. And so this part of the session is from the perspective of how an individual institution might approach OER work. But first, let me tell you a little bit about Digital Commons at Georgia Southern. Georgia Southern subscribes to the BPress Digital Commons platform for our institutional repository. This is where we collect, archive, and disseminate the intellectual and creative output of the university's faculty, staff, students, and community partners. 
In addition to a small number of open educational resources collected in our repository, some of the types of materials in Digital Commons at Georgia Southern are campus publications, faculty and student research, dissertations, data sets, and special collections. Uh, the repository also hosts 18 journals and the materials from over 30 conferences, so we can relate to all of you who said this is the other duties as assigned area of our jobs. Um, however, one of our top 10 most downloaded papers of all time is an OER with nearly 54,000 full text downloads. So this indicates a strong demand for open educational resources and supports developing a broader collection of subject areas. Next slide, please. We can start by thinking about a high level workflow for our inst institution. Our goal is to increase discovery, which we can do by adding OER to places where students and faculty already search for materials the institutional repository, and the library catalog. The workflow starts with public services librarians who are collaborating with faculty to locate and create OERs. Public services librarians can identify OERs and notify technical services staff of their location and existence. This is born digital content and we don't have a physical copy in hand which makes the institutional repository a viable next step. The repository team can create records in digital commons and add either full text materials or links to the resources. From there, the repository staff can share those records with cataloging librarians who can create records in OCLC and add them to our catalog. At Georgia Southern, we use the SpringShare LibApps ticketing system for managing our work which would help each person communicate information about the OER throughout the workflow. The additional access points going beyond LibGuides and OER specific databases and into the library catalog and institutional repository could help increase discoverability by capitalizing on existing patron information seeking behaviors. Next slide, please. Full accurate metadata is part of the solution in making sure that the content in the repository can be easily crawled and indexed by search engines. So my first step was to get acquainted with the different metadata standards relevant to OER and understanding what were the most common required and recommended elements. I knew we needed an approach that would include both local, national, and international standards for describing digital content plus metadata that captures OERs in particular. So locally at Georgia Southern, like I mentioned, we use the BPress Digital Commons platform, which is based on Dublin Core and offers a lot of flexibility in customizing metadata fields. For statewide standards, I started by asking our BPress rep to configure our metadata records like those on the Affordable Learning Georgia site because we wanted to include the same elements when developing Georgia Southern's prototype. I also analyzed the Digital Library of Georgia's metadata guidelines and the Georgia Knowledge Repository metadata guidelines to get a sense of recommended metadata for digital artifacts in Georgia's existing repositories. For OER specific guidelines, I leaned on the Bothman recommendations and studied both the OER common scheme and I triple ELAM to compile my list of metadata elements. And after I started my analysis, I discovered the OER Rosetta Stone, a tool that's moved OER discovery forward by recommending metadata fields for MARC records. And once I got my head wrapped around all of that, I brushed up on MARC 21 format and RDA for industry-wide cataloging standards. And taking all of these guidelines into account, I felt ready to move forward with developing a full collection prototype in Digital Commons. Next slide, please. For our prototype, we have a parent collection on the demo site for all open educational resources and then a child collection for each subject area. My thinking is that a subject hierarchy aligns with library classification systems that group related items together and provides a browsing experience for our OER collections. Next slide, please. 
Uh, Georgia Southern has a decent amount of OER for chemistry, so we started with that subject first. In Digital Commons, we set up what's called a book gallery style series. The advantage of the book gallery style is that you get a landing page that displays images of book covers next to the title, authors, and abstract. Uh, the book gallery style is similar to scrolling down a page of search results in the library catalog, and then you can click on one of the records for more information or a link to the resource. Next slide, please. Others have done the work of analyzing required and recommended metadata. So my metadata map is stripped down to a simple crosswalk between databases, showing possible equivalent elements for our institutional repository and our library catalog. And what we're seeing here is a draft of my recommendations for metadata elements in digital commons at Georgia Southern, the definition of those elements, and some potential mark fields for creating catalog records. Now, some of these elements are self-explanatory. Those are the basic elements that we use as searchable access points. That includes the title, authors, subjects, and keywords. Um, I imagined that faculty and students may search for a resource by the course uh, title or the course number. So I thought those might be useful as a 246 field or varying forms of the title on a MARC record. The description or abstract could potentially go into the 520 summary field of a MARC record. Uh, for the Creative Commons license, I think it would be useful to take what is one element in our Digital Commons metadata record and split it into two fields for a MARC record. The 506 field for MARC records is a place uh, where you can note restrictions on access. And in this case, the materials are open access, which would be useful to have a note of in the library catalog. And it's also good to have the 540 field that the OER Rosetta Stone identifies and that includes the terms governing use of materials after access has been provided. Publication date and publisher, um, those would fit nicely on the 264 field for a MARC record. Uh, the source is a related resource or something the OER is based on. It could be represented in a general note 500 field on MARC. Um, the name of the grant and a link could go in the comments section in Digital Commons and then the 536 field on a MARC record. For material types, I use the OER Commons list and descriptions, and we have it configured in uh, Digital Commons as a drop down menu for each type. So, for example, a textbook or a lesson plan or a syllabus. And then the cataloger working on a MARC record, this might fit into the 300 field for physical description and extent of the material, 347, and maybe the 516 field. Format is uh, defined on the OER Commons metadata template as the media type of the item. So in Digital Commons, we configure that as a drop-down menu where staff can select text, video, or image. And this fits in with the leader slash 06 field and the 366 fields in MARC used to describe the type of content, like text or still images. And finally, upload file in Digital Commons is the location of the resource. So that could be a URL, um, or we can provide the full text, of course, in the repository. And for cataloging, um, that would correspond to the 856 field. And I would recommend that the URL go to the record in Digital Commons so that we can gather data on usage and present a cohesive, and growing collection of OER. Next slide, please. Uh, we're working with Born Digital Open Educational Resources with varying levels of descriptive information available. So we want to use all of the tools at our disposal to collect OER into the repository and create MARC records for our catalog. The Digital Commons platform has the option to add customized metadata instructions, so we decided to use this feature so we can include those def definitions and recommendations from the metadata map. That should help our repository staff gather complete metadata, and we can share it with our cataloger. Um, so this slide has some examples that's still in a draft version, and there's more customization we could do and continue to add metadata instructions. Um, for now, we're keeping this project on our demo site while we explore the process of collaborating with public services and technical services to increase discoverability of OERs at Georgia Southern. 
Okay, next slide. So this brings us to our last conversation starter. Well, um, I think what we're going to do is jump over this one because we have so many participants that we went through amazing amounts of answers and therefore the rehearsal was a little different. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, we are going to go through this one, but it is good to consider what resources and tools you wish you had in order to make OER easier to discover. Um, it is 1225 exactly. <laughs> so um, I, I know, um, let's see here. John, did you want to say anything about the end of this? Well, we are, as you said, at uh, 25 after. Um, you guys could stick around for a little bit longer, no, two, no five or so minutes. Uh, as you say, there's a lot of questions, a lot of participants, so I'm sure people might have some more questions for you, but I can stop the recording right now and um, pass over the hosting um, to one of you if, if you'd like. Yeah, uh, one good thing to keep in mind, I mean, we're going to share out the slides and the PDF with the Mentimeter answers. There is a team resources Google Doc in here that has things like that super helpful spreadsheet uh, that I think y'all would really like, um, including, I think, also an email uh, getting sent out to like a template for that, like really cool stuff. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. 